Hey guys, welcome to the Challenge Podcast. I'm Coach Steve. And I'm Coach Nick. And we're going to be talking about everything fitness, health, and the challenge. Let's get on with the show. What's up, guys? Coach Steve here, and welcome back to another episode of the Challenge Weekly Show. Today, I'm joined with our co-host, Coach Nick. Nick, how are we doing today? I'm very well, thank you, Coach Steve. How are you? I'm well, I'm well. Uh, you know, last night was a bit of an adventure in uh, Dad World, where my boy is teething at the moment. So I was uh, up in the middle of the night battling away um, through that. But I, I believe that it is a... a, a worldwide thing that's happening right now on the 8th of the 8th where yep. you know it's kind of like when the when there's a full moon you know like when when things just don't align and everyone's just a little bit a little bit wacky a little bit crazy um mm. i'm not too sure about it though yeah lion's gate the portal um oh. to your manifestations the 8th of the 8th <laughs> The Lions Gate Portal Manifestations, 8th of the 8th. So uh, this podcast released on the 9th, so Tuesday the 9th. Uh, so right. yesterday, listening th- to this, uh, yesterday was the uh, Lions Gate Portal. So if you're into your energies and the uh, the, 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 the star signs, astrology, uh, and you want to have your Lions Gate, Leo, um, align with the, the sun, uh, yesterday was the day or today is the day if you are... You're going to have to wait for another year. That's right. Um, So if you want to visit your ancestors. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, it's one of my favorite books. Um, Yeah, it's actually um, a series. So it's a fiction series, but I love that. And yeah, when I found out that this was the day, I was like, oh, my gosh, yes. So I'm trying to manifest some good stuff for myself. I like it. I like it. Well, it's it's kind of like a, a start of a new year, I guess, on the 8th of the 8th. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you can manifest and create anything that you want. And I think that's a good time to think about this phase of the challenge, Nick. So we are in week five. We transition into the next phase. So similar to how uh, I believe the uh, Egyptian culture would look at the 8th of the 8th, the start of the new um, era or a new phase. It's just like that with uh, week five of the challenge, where we've gone through that first phase, week one to four, where many of us have um, established some good routines, some good habits. Some of us have seen some amazing progress so far and others of course uh, you know maybe life gets in the way at at times where maybe they've fallen off of the quote wagon or things have got a little bit difficult maybe they got unwell got hit with the old spicy cough and everything else is kind of floating around or you know just other things kind of happen and the the challenge the challenge does get challenging nick (laughs) and it's in the name so i think now is a great time to reflect on your last four weeks of the challenge. So weeks one to four, and it's a great time just to reflect and, and take a moment of you know, introspection and think about uh, you know, uh, your effort over the last four weeks. And here's uh, three questions that I often recommend you to ask yourself frequently, um, you know, if not uh, d- weekly or, or daily, um, not every hour, because that's a bit much, but uh, a great time <laughs> to ask answer. yourself sometimes. Yeah. If you're having a big day, you can ask yourself hour by hour or if you're training in the gym, you could ask these things uh, set by set or even rep mm. by rep. Anyway, so the three questions. Number one is, what have I been doing well? Okay, what have I been doing well? And this is a great time just to uh, bring up the highlight reel, everything you've been kicking, how you've been kicking goals, how you've been kicking ass. Uh, and that could be that you've been, you know, 100% adherent, or maybe you've been following the, the, the meal plan, or maybe you've lost a little bit of weight, or maybe you have uh, had that chat with your partner about, you know, wanting to do this challenge and uh, structuring your life so that you can actually get into the gym, whatever it is, what have you been doing well is the first question that uh, is good to ask yourself, right? The next one here is that reflective process of what can I improve on? And I think that we can all improve on something. Okay. And it's very quick to say, oh, well, I've been doing everything perfectly. And uh, I, I doubt that. Uh, I think every person uh, from the, the humble beginner to the uh, elite of the elite, you know, maybe they're competing at the Olympics or the, the Commonwealth Games, or wherever they are, elite sports people around the world, they are always looking for ways that they can improve. And uh, I think the first one is if you say that you are 100% of something, uh, you're, you're probably not. Um, you know, we are, we may get close to like 99%, but there's always a little bit more that we can improve, we can get better on. And there's, of course, rabbit holes you can fall down and such. Uh, but, you know, what can you improve on? And I think all of us can point at something that you could improve on over the last four weeks. Okay. Mm-hmm. And the fo- final question to ask yourself is to uh, project yourself into the future slightly and ask yourself, are there any challenges coming up over the next few weeks that I need to overcome? 
Okay, uh, that few weeks could be, you know, are there any challenges over the next few days, the next few hours, the next few sets, next few reps <laughs> that I need to overcome? Okay, and that could be that, you know, this weekend is your kid's birthday, or next weekend you have a, a work breakup um, where you're going to go to a pub. What are you going to do? Uh, or maybe, you know, it's you've got these big deadlines at work. It's going to be really stressful. It's going to be long hours, and you're going to struggle to do meal prep. Whatever it is, it's a great time to project yourself in the future and think, okay, what challenges do I have coming up? What can I do now to prepare for that? Okay. And those three questions you can repeat over and over again. What have I been doing well? What can I improve on? And are there any challenges coming up that I need to overcome? Okay. And by reflecting on those three questions, uh, you can uh, consistently improve uh, your fitness journey and move closer towards your goals, whatever they might be. Definitely. Definitely. You have to. You have to look at yourself sort of in a bit of a detached way sometimes and then remove the emotion and just think about um, what you can change every single time to make it better. That's right. Mm. Now, Nick, we had our phase one check-in over last weekend. Well, it opened last weekend. Now, it's still open today and there isn't a closing time of that phase one check-in. So you can upload that check-in photo uh, at any time, okay? Now, um, you do need to upload a phase one and a phase two check-in photo uh, to be eligible for the final competition, okay? So you do need to upload that photo and simply a check-in photo. So you don't need any documentation, no like, you know, check-in document or newspaper or anything like that. It's just literally a little selfie. It's a great time to recreate your first photo. So if you were taking your first photo, maybe you, you donned the, the blue undies uh, and you stood in front of a, a white wall in your living room, uh, it's a great time to recreate that. So you can get a really nice comparison photo between that start photo, the phase one check-in, phase two check-in, and then the final photo. And you could have four photos that are identical to each other that really highlights your progression, okay? So you can still upload that photo as of today, um, and there's no deadline for that. So you do have time to upload that photo, okay? I do want to highlight and celebrate all those individuals that posted their progress photos onto our Facebook social hub. Uh, that was really amazing to see over the weekend and still more even this, this morning when I was having a look um, coming through. And it's great to see the progress that individuals are, are having um, and many are uh, losing, you know, multiple kilos, which is which is great. Now, um, my, my comment here is uh, just be cautious if you are looking at other individuals and their progress, you know, they're on their own journey and viewing somebody who says that they've lost five kilos, that might be out of context slightly, you know, one, you don't know where they started, maybe they were, uh, you know, getting on the beers or <laughs> whatever they were, where they, you know, may have lost lots of uh, weight really quickly, that may not have been body fat, okay? So that's the first thing. And the second thing is that uh, each individual would lose a different proportion of their body weight each week. So myself, I'm, you know, just cruising over 100 kilos these days. I'm a little bit bigger than Coach Nick. So if I lost two kilos, that's the equivalent of, let's say, 2% of my body weight. Whereas if Coach Nick lost two kilos, that's the equivalent of maybe 4 or 5% of my body weight, right? So uh, it's better to look at maybe percentages of weight loss rather than actual kilos of weight loss, okay? So it's better to look at percentages. Um, and then once you kind of change that focus, being like, oh, I'm only down uh, 500 grams this you know week, you go, well, you weigh 50 kilos. So 500 grams is awesome. That's a whole percent of your body weight in one week. That's, that's huge. You should be proud of that. Um, so if you are still caught up around maybe like the actual number on the scales or the actual number of loss per week, uh, think percentages, you know, it might, may help to take away that emotion and really look at the, from a statistical point of view, right? I've lost this many percent this week or this month or this phase and that could be a great way to uh you know keep on track with with the goal that we're trying to achieve yeah definitely and yeah really try not to compare i know we say that but we really mean it because yeah you just don't know what's going on with someone else and um yeah numbers are only meaningful to your own circumstances that's right that's right mm. Now, Nick, I thought we'd go through a, uh, a, a super quick uh, framework, a framework to help individuals uh, who may be at this stage of the challenge and they are not seeing progress towards their goal. Mm -hmm. And what can they do to overcome a, quote, plateau? Okay. Yes. Now, this framework, it can be applied to almost any goal. Let that be a weight loss goal, weight gain goal, maybe a, a physical goal, like oh, I wanna deadlift my body weight um, or run you know, a 5K in under 30 minutes or whatever it is. Uh, you know, this framework can be applied to those goals. 
Mm. Okay. Now, the first thing I will comment on is that, you know, we are four weeks into a 12 week challenge. So we're not even halfway yet. So uh, if you are in a position where you think you've plateaued, you know, there's still lots more time and our progress towards goals is similar to that of, let's say, the, the stock market, right? Um, you know, all of us have kind of interacted with a, a stock market or understand the stock market. It's on the news, it's in our super funds. You know, we understand that the, it goes up and down every single day. Uh, there's times where it seems like it's flat, but if we zoom out a little bit, we can see the general trend and, and such like that. So starting off our little framework, step one is to actually confirm that you're in a plateau or you're not seeing progress. Okay. And for that, you need to ask yourself, am I tracking my progress correctly? Or am I even tracking my progress at all? So, you know, let's use the example of a weight loss goal. I want to lose weight. Okay, cool. No dramas. Um, I want to lose five kilos. Okay, no dramas. That's your goal. Uh, who am I to judge your goal? All right. And if you then claim I'm not losing weight, of course, the first question is, all right, are you weighing yourself? Okay, <laughs> because that's directly related to like the goal, right? So you need to weigh yourself. Now, we've spoken about this a few times on the podcast and different mediums about the concept of those daily fluctuations and making an analogy to the stock market. If you were to look at, uh, you know, your stock portfolio, or your super fund, or um, maybe you bought, I don't know, like Amazon stock on one particular day, and then you only look at it once a month and you, you know, get really emotional that the price has maybe gone up or gone down and such without taking into account all those daily changes and zooming out and looking at the bigger trend, you know, that might be misleading and you go, well, oh, I'm going to panic buy or panic sell this stock, um, or let's say I'm going to withdraw my super fund. Well, if you're of that age, right, because of a, a, an initial look at this data. So it's better to look at more information. So like tracking it daily or frequently and averaging out the data, maybe tracking, plotting it on a graph and seeing the trend over time. Now, of course, when you are confirming if you are in a plateau, you need to confirm that what you're looking at, as in the information, how you're measuring it, is actually related to the goal, <laughs> okay? So let's say, say again, your goal is uh, weight loss and you're trying to track your progress by how much you deadlift, those goals may not be helpful, right? And if anything, we they always make... love that goal. <laughs> we do. I think performance goals are, are great, but if you want yeah. to base your weight loss on a performance goals, that mm. could be a very uh, juxtaposing goal, Absolutely. right? Where often when we are losing weight, we are in a, a, a decreased energy state. So if I'm trying to lose weight, I'm in an energy deficit. I am like having less energy than I am in an energy surplus. So if I go to try to perform at a peak level, I'm going to be, I'm going to have less energy, right? So I won't be able to achieve my performance goals, right? So that's often why maybe uh, power lifters and such kind of have that quote thicker look because they're often eating at an energy surplus because they want that excess energy so that they can perform a certain way, right? So a few questions to ask yourself, are you actually in a plateau? Are you tracking it correctly? correctly? Is there just a statistical error in the way that you're tracking your progress? are you looking at the right information? So if you are trying to track your weight loss and maybe a closer uh, thing that individuals would look at is something like their images. If you're trying to compare your weekly images and you're playing a game of spot the difference between Monday week one and Monday week two, and you're kind of scratching your head, well, like, oh, I, I don't see any difference. I'm not losing weight. That can have its own biases and problems with it in tracking that information. So that's step one. I confirm that you're in a plateau. Nick, take us away. What would step two be? Okay, step two is uncover any masks. So is there anything that could be masking your pros, um, your progress? So um, is there anything that's kind of covering up the actual data? So, for example, if I drink, I've got a jug here that's got two cups, one and a half cups of some sort of coffee, um, if I if I drink this right now I, and um, go and weigh myself, I'll probably be about 500 grams um, heavier just on the scales and I'll be like, oh, Coach Steve, I haven't lost any weight today. And, um, yeah, th things like that are very um, deceptive if, if you don't think about it. And why would you? Why would you actually 
I mean, unless you knew about this, why would you actually put two and two together and go, well, I've I've had that to drink or I've had something to eat? Or it, even honestly with women, um, it can be fluctuations uh, between sort of the menstrual cycle and then also even ovulation is another time when some, some women um, tend to retain a little bit of water as well. Um, so hormonal fluctuations, they're another mask. So when somebody's saying that they're not progressing, I do like to sort of um, strip those away and actually say, is it is it that time of the month? Is it um, that you have uh, weighed yourself at a different time? Sometimes even um, weighing yourself earlier. Like I get up at, at you know, we know this about 4.30 sometimes. Sometimes if I get up at 4 and I weigh myself, I, I'll weigh less later on um, than I do at 4 a.m. So it's... Um, you've got to try and keep those variables out of it, um, those masks, because otherwise um, your data is going to be incorrect. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think I just want to relate it to maybe a different goal for some other individuals out there who may not have weight loss goals. Let's say your goal was to deadlift, let's say two times your body weight. Yeah. And you measured your one rep max in a gym with uh, a certain environment around you and you, I don't know, forgot your your belt at home and you decided to go barefoot on a, you know, a slippery lifting platform and you lift your deadlift and you kind of missed your, your, your target and then you go home maybe a week later and you go to lift it again, you're in a different environment, maybe you wear shoes and socks because it's cold in your garage, it's a different barbell and maybe you have big wonky bumper plates whereas at the gym those calibrated plates uh, you know, if you are then going to try to compare your progress, you know, there might be other variables or other things that might be masking that progress just because it's simply different. Yeah. Um, so I agree. You, you need to determine is your progress being masked by another variable? Yeah, that's so true. That's the other thing that we, we need to remember that it's not always about weight loss. Some people have other goals. So it's good that you you mentioned that as well, because it's good for us to refer to that. That's half of our challenge, really. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Next step three here would be to reflect, <laughs> reflect on your adherence to your strategy. So you are currently in a state of homeostasis and you are applying an intervention to make a change. So you're applying a strategy to make a change so that you can move towards your goal, whatever that is, right? So you may have the best plan in the world. It may be written by a sophisticated AI, by our overlords, Google, and it could be the best thing for you and your body and your needs. But if you don't follow that plan, what's the point of having it, right? So, uh, you know, often we see individuals, maybe at this stage of the challenge, saying something like, oh, you know, I've been training every single day. Um, I've been drinking this much water. I've been getting this much sleep. I've been doing this many steps, um, but oh, you know, I've been maybe like 50% on my nutrition. Why am I not losing weight? And you kind of go, well, you know, that's a big part of our weight loss is our approach to nutrition. <laughs> and if you are only adherent 50% of the time, you're not adherent 50% of the time. <laughs> so, you know, you, would benefit from improving your adherence to that strategy so then you know that strategy is working or not yeah you can't then throw away your your diet or your meal plan and go up oh, this doesn't work for me it's like well you didn't even follow it right so uh step three is always to reflect on your adherence i would say just for argument's sake you know you want to be close to following that strategy as you can you can never be 100 percent. we understand that but if you give yourself a number to be let's say 75%, 80% adherent to a plan, you know, three quarters of the time. Okay, you could be more confident saying, well, I'm being majority, majority <laughs> adherent to this plan. Um, is it effective or not is the next question, right? Yeah, so absolutely. And um, with that, it's, it's very, very important to um, also not set yourself a plan where you're almost setting yourself up to fail. So for example, say um, if you choose rapid everything, it's so tempting when you're hungry to just have a massive episode of, of just eating everything in the room. Um, sometimes it's better to go moderate, slow and steady, like, um, yeah, the hare and the tortoise, the tortoise and the hare, even though I'd love the hare to win because we know how much I love my bunny family. But um, yeah, slow and steady. Yeah, that's I, very I agree. Important. Yeah, and I think like that's also um, th that heads into our step four, which is um, rule out fatigue. Um, if you're fatigued, like if you've got diet fatigue, it's actually a thing. Um, it's 
probably unlikely to happen in the first phase. But perhaps as we get a little bit closer to the end, especially if you are going with that rapid and you're going quite, you know, quite all in, there is a chance that you are mentally and physically fatigued. So um, you have to sometimes ask yourself, do I need a break? Now, it doesn't mean do I need a break and fall off the wagon completely. It can mean that you may, um, you know, just raise your calories a little bit, but still, when we say raise your calories, we don't say um, go crazy with all the foods, just eat a little bit more of what you're already eating and um, still keep all the good habits and things and just maybe give yourself a little bit of a reset. Um, when you're in a deficit for a long time uh, and you, you feel hungry all the time, and you start to be a bit food focused, it's really a good time to, to think about um, whether you need a bit of a a diet deload and also I mean on the other side of it if you're not hitting your pbs and things say for example you Steve um you know with with baby George there's no way that today you're going to have the best session in the whole wide world because you didn't get much sleep so you'd have to um if you didn't live very well you'd have to say oh I am a little bit fatigued today so you'd have to cut yourself a break wouldn't you that's right yeah and you're, you're right that isn't just an excuse to you maybe take today off completely or if I was to choose to go on a diet break because I'm diet fatigued it's not an excuse to go well that's it my diet's gone it's just a little uh a timeout session it's like you're playing a basketball game up oh, timeout you know just give me give me five minutes of a break and that could be that you reduce your volume maybe you increase your calories um, or maybe you just take like let's say the the a little bit of time off to go okay well I'm going to deload here reset my body so that I can keep on going and I think this is really important for those who have been following their goal for a really long time. Now, again, in the challenge here, phase one, we're four weeks in. We've been following this goal for just four weeks, but there are some folk who are doing this challenge who have been doing challenges for years. Yes. So they could be they could be six months, 12 months and beyond working towards their, their goal. And some mm. folk have lost, you know, let's say 50 kilos in their yeah. time in the challenge where they're, they're on this massive journey. They're not just thinking 12 weeks at a time, they're thinking on the big scale. So for some folk out there, they may benefit from a little bit of time off. And sure, you could say that maybe between challenges, you know, that week off is that break. But if you have been dieting really hard for six months, 12 months or more, uh, you may need a little bit of time off where you eat a little bit more food, you know, reset mentally, physically, and that might be enough to, uh, you know, keep you going for the next couple of months. Yeah, so true. Look, I'll just give you a quick taste of my own story because I'm obviously uh, prepping for a comp and stuff like that. I've just entered that phase where it's getting a little bit harder and I know that I'm very food focused at the moment because I keep asking Shane, I'm like, what have you eaten? And he's like, why are you so obsessed? You know? And I'm like, did you just have popcorn? Um, yeah, what did you have? Like, what'd you have? And he's like, why do you ask me so many times? And so, so for me, like, it's sort of coming up to the stage where I may need a couple of days just to chill out and have a bit of a break from it so that I can reset and be less food focused and food obsessed because that's what happens when you start to get super hungry. So just watch out for those little signs. Um, it's quite valid. You know, you don't have to be on a diet every day, all day to see results. You just need to be consistent. That's right. Mm -hmm. So Nick, so far we've got step one, confirm that you're in a plateau or you're not making progress towards your goal. Step two, uncover any masks or any other variables that could be masking your progress. Step three, we're gonna reflect on our adherence to the strategy so that we can move towards our goal so that we are being mostly adherent to the plan. Step four, we're ruling out fatigue, meaning that uh, just make sure that you're not just simply tired of dieting or training or working towards your goal. And that's the reason why you're not seeing progress towards your goal. And finally, step five here, the final step is where we modify our strategy. Okay. Now, often we have individuals saying things such as, uh, you know, trust the process. Okay. Which is, which is completely fair, completely true where, you know, we have a strategy, we need to trust that strategy. Uh, but sometimes that strategy needs some tailoring or modification. Okay. So you may have written, um, your own plan or strategy to reach a particular goal. You, you may want to be able to run five kilometers, just full stop. I want to be able to run without stopping five kilometers. Okay. You may have written a running plan for yourself. Maybe someone has written you a plan and you might be following that plan. Um, but if you're not making progress towards that, you know, you can't simply keep doing it forever and it's not going to get you there. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, isn't that the, the, the definition of insanity or fit sanity, fit sanity. That, we, that we spoke about a couple of podcasts yeah. ago where, you know, if you 
did the same thing forever, you can't expect different results. Okay. Mm. And we see this in the, ch in the challenge where individuals would sign up to the challenge, reject the programs that we offer and are confident that, that what they have been doing forever has been working for them forever when they're not happy with the results they've been getting from what they've been doing previously. Okay. Uh, so you could see how that might be limiting thought patterns. So, um, if you are in a position now where you're following the plan and you, your goal is to lose weight and you're not losing weight, you've confirmed that you're not losing weight. You've determined that you're not masking your progress through other means. You're being adherent to the plan and you're ruling out fatigue and you're still going, well, Steve, I'm not losing weight. Okay. Now it's time to make a change to the strategy. Now, what do you change? My first bit of advice would be to make a small change. Okay. You know, taking a very scientific approach. If you are, you know, heading towards somewhere, you modify just one thing and determine if that small change was the change that you needed to make. You don't want to change everything, like, you know, kind of throwing everything at the wall and hoping, hoping something sticks. So you're, if you're following a meal plan and you've been prescribed 2000 calories, there's no point on just going, well, that's it. I'm going to go intermittent fasting, throw in keto, throw in vegan plans. I'm going to omit um, all FODMAP foods and then reduce my calories to a thousand calories a day. You know, and double, a, my steps, double, and my double my steps, double my steps. my steps. So, yeah. you, you know, you're throwing lots of things at it. And it's like, okay, I'm going to uh, drastically increase my water. I'm going to start, you know, redoing all my, my supplementation. And I'm going to start doing Uberman sleeping patterns where I sleep, you know, three hours <laughs> at a time, eight times a day or whatever it is. Right. So oh, you, can mate. See, you can see the limitations in something yeah. like that, where you throw lots of stuff at it. Uh, and again, this is what we commonly see in the challenge where individuals you know, live a certain lifestyle, start the challenge. They want to change every single thing in their life to become a fit person, which is fair, which is partly what we're asking for individuals, follow this meal plan, follow this training plan. But sometimes changing lots of things, one, you don't know what's working and two, it can be a big change. So my advice, start small, make a small change. When it comes down to weight loss, it's, it's simply a, a conversation about energy in versus energy out. Simple conversation, difficult to apply. So either we choose to reduce our calorie intake by let's say 100 calories or increase our step count by let's say 1,000 steps. So you just modify those two variables. So sometimes it's really obvious where uh, if you're currently doing 2,000 steps a day, you could probably increase that to 3,000 steps a day because that's a pretty easy thing to do rather than reduce your calories. Then on the flip side, if you're currently doing 20,000 steps a day, you can't really add an extra thousand steps because that's just a lot of steps, right? So you may, may be easier just to reduce your calories by a hundred calories a day and then retest. How do we retest? You know, maybe take a week to allow those changes to apply to your body and see if you start noticing a change. Again, measuring our body weight changes uh, frequently so we can see that, ch that change, that variable difference, okay? Um, but that's our five steps, Nick. We yeah. Yeah, that's a, and perfect. The, the thing is, as you were saying, you don't have to always change everything either. So if you've if you've gone and changed everything, you've kind of dug yourself a hole because you don't know what is working, and then um, you've changed everything, and it's so much effort, and you might not need to make that much effort to no. get that change. No. Yeah. So if you're sitting there thinking, "Well, Steve, I'm not making any progress towards my goal, whatever that is," take a moment, think about our our five steps that we are outlining in our framework. Confirm you're in a plateau, uncover any masks, reflect on your adherence, rule out any fatigue, and then finally modify your strategy, making a small change. Okay. Mm -hmm. Nick, I'd like to move on to our next segment here. We've got our community highlight where we highlight some members of our community. So Nick, take us away. Who would you like to highlight this week? All right. Starting off, we've got Brett Kirby. So Brett Kirby says, I've been a bit quiet this round, working hard in the background and playing around with my nutrition has seen a huge change in volume, currently sitting between 3,500 to 4,000 calories per day over five meals. While the increase in calories brings a little fluff, it also brings huge rewards in PBs and strength. This week I've marked four PBs off for multiple reps and sets. So leg press, 280 kilos, leg extensions, 140 kilos, hack squats, 240 kilos, and squats, 120 kilos. And he says in brackets, still working on this. So well done, Brett. We love some PBs and we love hearing about the extra calories because as we were saying before, it's not just a weight loss challenge. 
I like that. I, I like that a lot. And uh, if you think about some of those numbers and you're like, whoa, geez, like leg pressing 280 kilos and leg extension 140 kilos. If you feel that, you know, those numbers are really high compared to yours, just remember some machines might be slightly different angulation and such. So you're not a lesser person if you can't uh, lift as much as Brett can um, i do know brett has done multiple challenges with us and has now now into the next phases of his journey where he's really looking for, forward to building some strength and some muscle and that comes with eating extra food uh so i'm excited for brett and you know working on his body composition goals which is the goal of either fat loss or building muscle improving body composition via improving our muscle mass so good on you brett keep going buddy yeah, it's a great journey and not until you're in the dieting phase do you look back and remember fondly that journey. Um, although you can change it at any time and go into a surplus again. But, yeah, good on you, Brett. So the next one is Miko Adams. So um, I quite like this one. This is so cute. He goes, to walk or not to walk, that is the question. Update. So I went because it was cold, you see. And here's a rundown. Not so good. Couldn't feel my fingers or toes. Eyes watered the whole way. The path was icy. A lady ran past me just wearing a singlet. I had four layers on. The good, fresh air, blue skies, me time. Got my steps in for the day. Wasn't the only crazy person out and about. Found a golf ball. That's cute, isn't it? <laughs> so overall, the good outweighs the bad. Although, I'll let you know my final verdict once my fingers and toes defrost. P.S. He wrote to me, he said, Coach Nick, how's that heating feature on the app coming along? So, um, <laughs> Because I did promise him that. I don't know why. Like probably in about version 150, when we get up to the My Fitness Power levels, there might be a heating um, yep. switch on the app. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think the the heating feature is just before the auto spotter feature, where the app <laughs> builds arms and spots you on the bench press. So um, yeah, it's 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 in there. It's in there. Yep. Perfect. Um, love it. So that was lovely. That's adorable because I can relate to that one too. Um, now the next one is Jonathan Nad. Start of week one to start of week four. When you put it in a collage, it really drives that motivation up. Um, so that was obviously he was doing some pictures. So the reason I chose this one is just to remind you to document. You don't have to share it or you can share it because also sometimes like if you're like myself, if you're used to seeing your pictures, you'll really be able to spot the difference. But if you're not and you're happy sharing it, people are really welcoming and happy to point out to you your changes. And sometimes you can't see it yourself. And when you put it up, the community will really get behind you as well. And he says, um, just need to try and hit my steps now as I haven't been even been hitting my 7,500. So that's really good because it sort of ties into what we were saying about um, progress and always knowing that you can do something better. So I love the fact that he's given himself a little compliment and said, this is what he's done and he feels good, but this is what he needs to do to get better. And that's, um, that's really a mindset of a champion, I reckon. Yeah. Good on you, Jonathan. And you can definitely see where you need to improve. And if you are able to increase that step count, you know, you can keep seeing progress. So keep on going, bud. Mm -hmm. Now I've got a couple here, Nick. Uh, so the first one actually goes out to one of our brand ambassadors, and that's Ashley Chettleberg. And I know that Ashley uh, listens to a lot of the Challenge podcast. So Ash, if you listen to this, how you doing, bud? Hey. Uh, so to everybody else, um, go and follow Ash on Instagram. So it's ash.c underscore n dot challenge. And you can go see Ash's journey where he posts a lot about um, his training, the foods that he's eating, and his lifestyle as well. Um, we've done a podcast with Ash. We spoke a lot about um, his approach to um, you know nutrition and training and and his family um, and then also some limitations that he has around some um, you know dietary dietary things. So uh, you know if you haven't already, go check out that one, Ashley Chettleberg. Now Ash uh, made a post which I thought was really cool, and he writes, "It's Sunday, so you know what that means: Pancakes Day." And I have a pretty common uh, Pancakes Day at home here as well, where uh, I haven't done it in, in uh, just a couple of weeks, but often on Sundays I would whip out. The, uh, Coach Steve pancake recipe, a little bit famous in the family, but that's okay. So Ash has the same thing, pancakes on Sunday, and he writes, people always think that I go without pleasure foods when I'm on, quote, the challenge, but there are so many options that can hit your calorie and macro targets without sacrificing on taste if you're willing to put in a bit of work. And I think that's completely true where, uh, you know, he posted a photo of this uh, really nice um, pancake uh, setup, which is really cool. 
And I think that, you know, it really highlights someone like Ashley, who's done multiple challenges with us, who embraces the uh, challenge lifestyle. He's one of our brand ambassadors and he is out there enjoying pancakes on a Sunday, just like Coach Steve, uh, and, um, you know, making it work within his calorie intake. So if you're sitting there thinking still, we're in week four and, you know, the, the food is, can be pretty bland, make a few changes, think outside the box, and you may find that you can enjoy Sunday's um, pancakes on a Sunday um, and and still make it fit within your progress. Absolutely. And, um, you know, you can always, you can share the recipe of your pancakes <laughs> in, the, in the show notes, if you like, Coach Steve. Yeah, look, uh, I'm kind of like Colonel Sanders. My, my <laughs> family recipe is uh, close to the heart and, uh, yeah, maybe on my deathbed I might release that, that oh. uh, famous pancake recipe which is simply uh good old flour and water it's crazy <laughs> I wonder if, yeah i wonder if um in episode 100 we can celebrate by you making a couple of pancakes for us all oh, pancakes we'll see we'll see we'll see oh, love that <laughs> the next nick the next one here yep. i think goes out to maybe your cousin anita bertolini right? <laughs> very much no. uh so anita anita bertolini and she writes uh no words trust the process already said my piece about trust the process but that's okay so she writes trust the process just done my four week photo comparisons and all i could say is wow 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 mm -hmm. i'm even more <laughs> pumped to continue stay disciplined push heavy and regain all the self-confidence i lost don't worry it's slowly coming back the future is looking fit with a capital fit exclamation mark now like this she's highlighted that similar to the post from Jonathan that before and after photo can help us, you know, keep motivated and give us a little extra boost of inspiration or motivation. And that could be your before and after photos, or maybe somebody else's before and after photos. Uh, and it's all about, you know, staying disciplined, being adherent to the plan and maybe trust the process slightly, uh, but then not being afraid to change the process slightly so that you can keep going to it. What I prefer to say is commit to the process. So it's going to take a bit of work, commit to it uh, so that you can stay on track and achieve your goals. The final one here goes out to Donna Wood. So Donna's done quite a number of challenges in the past with us. And Donna writes, does anyone else have that awkward check-in face? And I thought this was a little bit cheeky. And she posted her before and after photos. And yeah, we do all have that awkward check-in face. Uh, she also writes, can see small changes taking place and more importantly, feeling healthier. Even in the last four weeks didn't go as well as you liked, don't throw it in. Remember, there's still eight weeks to get back on track and smash out some changes. Happy weekend. And I think Donna highlights it there where, you know, it is four, we are four weeks in, the four weeks has flown by, but we've also got eight weeks left of the challenge. So if the last four weeks have not gone according to plan, and we have seen a, a number of posts, uh, both on the, the forum, our Facebook social hub, and even individuals trying to contact us um, on social medias or via email, uh, saying that, you know, last four weeks were trash and blah, 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 blah. There's still time to make change. So, you know, you can work on yourself, look for improvements and, you know, keep going over the next eight weeks. And you can, I can guarantee that if you put in the effort over the next eight weeks, that you can see some amazing progress towards your goal. Yes, Donna. And can I just share a secret about the awkward checking face? The reason that we have that is because usually the, the one where your physique looks the best is where your face looks the worst and nobody cares about their face when they're showing off their physique. <laughs> you just can't get the, you cannot get the two. They just don't match up. So it, often if I'm doing a check-in, I'll put like a bunny cartoon over my face. Because it's, <laughs> like, it's just not relevant for this. <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Nick, let's move on to our next segment here. We have our Coach's Corner where we offer our tip for the week. So, Nick, what advice do you have for us? All right. So, you know how well, well, I've talked about fit sanity. I've talked like, about lots of different things with fit. Um, but this one here is fit fit fluences. So, influencer workouts. And um, what I've seen in my time, in my time, it's sort of been the rise of that. Because even when I started, there wasn't even Instagram. I mean, really, I think Facebook was still where you just popped up your family photos and didn't think twice. Like I did a lot of photos of the kids when they were small and maybe like a couple of things of, oh, I've done a triathlon, look at me, that sort of thing. We we still did, we still sort of looked up bodybuilding.com online, you know, that kind of thing to, to find out information. 
So once Instagram started, um, it was quite cool because you got to see what everyone was doing. And, and then the rise of the online coach came. Now you and I are both online coaches and um, there's certainly, it's certainly a wonderful thing to be. The only thing I have a problem with, and um, I'll put it out there, is just these people with these amazing physiques, let's not get it wrong, absolutely amazing physiques that sort of tend to claim that they got it by basically jumping around and um, doing lots of banded work and other things that look quite good and are quite also easy to film. So let's just remember that. It's it's pretty hard to set up all the different things on your own if you're a, somebody that, that makes their living out of filming stuff. The heavy stuff, the heavy hard work that they would have done is A, ugly, B, often you need someone to spot you or you need someone to help you with that kind of a thing um, when you're kind of at your peak, and um, C, bloody boring, okay? And it's sort of hard to sell that. And I think people have questioned sort of, I think people are loving our programs, but they have questioned why is there no hit? Why is there no cardio? And I think it's because we are sort of not really interested in that influencer type thing. I don't think either one of us has a dream to be the next influencer. Like even when, you know, if, if there's a suggestion of us doing what I eat in a day, we both die a little inside <laughs> because it's it's very you and I are very plastic container very kind of whatever was last night's dinner was made extra I might eat a couple of eggs you might eat some spaghetti and it's not very exciting but but um you know we go about getting our goals just by doing the same thing over and over again which which can be quite boring so I just would like to to just make you as a consumer aware that the bells and the whistles are there to sell things. Often these people are promoting an active wear brand as well that they may have um, invented themselves or, you know, are affiliated with. So they have to look good in the clothes. They're going to have certain angles. And so the exercises that they do in those videos or even perhaps in their programs sometimes are not the ones that necessarily got them into the shape that they got into. I can guarantee anyone with a decent lot of muscle mass unless it's genetic has either had some pharmaceutical help or well and or has trained really really hard in the background doing this their compound movements things that you probably can't even necessarily um you know advise the the general population to to um to do in in a like a 20 minute workout that is being marketed so um that's why I just wanted to say, just be aware, but I think people are pretty savvy, but if you're wondering sometimes why we don't do supersets like other other programs and things, it's because we, we don't want to rush the process. I think we want quality over quantity. Do you agree? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think, uh, you know, over the past 10 years, the rise, oh, I mean, even before 10 years, like fitness is plagued with fit-attainment. Oh, that's yeah. a, another fit word go. where we're using fitness as, you know, a, a pastime entertainment. You know, it is one of the cheapest forms of entertainment, one of the cheapest uh, hobbies out there. I mean, I guess, uh, depending on who you're speaking to, right, where um, we have individuals come and join us on the challenge who are looking for entertainment where they're expecting uh, a hit workout with pop music and, and jumping around and all these things where they are not often uh, the strategies that are effective to improve body composition yeah and if we if uh, you know to put it bluntly the things that are effective for improving body composition those exercises that you know bodybuilders do that build muscle that build physiques that you know help us to lose body fat are the stock standard you know quote boring exercises like a squat or a deadlift um, and you know you, you don't see popular um, fitness influencers posting you know their squats and their deadlifts and their bench press because it's not sexy right what's sexy is it is making up a brand new workout that supersets this supersets this jumping around in in you know bright colored active wear which is great entertainment um, and you know sure it can get your your heart rate going a bit of a sweat on you recently release the endorphins like oh, I feel great but may not be super effective um, so if you are looking at the challenge and you're finding it maybe boring or expecting it to be entertaining um, you know that's simply not the goal of the challenge 
sure, we want to try to provide you with a little bit of entertainment through something like a podcast here and all, all our jokes, haha. Uh, uh-huh. but, You're so funny. Uh, so funny, but, you know, we do need to think about what is super effective, which is, you know, lift some heavy ass shit <laughs> and put yeah. it back down uh, and do it again and repeat it over time. And, you know, that repetition, uh, that practice, uh, of, you know, going to the gym, doing a similar workout, getting better at the execution of that exercise, building muscle through that is how we build these physiques. Um, you know, changing your workout every single day uh, or every single, you know, set randomly um, may not be super effective in the the process which we are trying to implement here. That's right. And look, a long time ago, I sort of made a decision um, and it's only really come to light more recently sort of with the challenge because you and I have the same values, but I'd prefer to train rather than entertain people. So um, I think we both feel like that. I know we're both just entertaining because we're funny, I reckon, <laughs> but, but like our conversations and things that they really revolve around, um, you know, wondering what what sort of quality stuff to bring to people next and you know your, your ten thousand words on nutrition and how do we cut that down <laughs> that sort of stuff so you know i think i think we're both just very very keen to teach you guys how to to do it you know to teach you guys to give you the tools you know not to make you reliant on our next 20 minute 30 minute workout you know you can, you can do that that's for sure but it's just you need to put in those hard yards and the quicker you get around to that, the quicker it'll all fall into place for you. That's right. No, I agree. And uh, I promise no more 10,000 word thesis from coach Steve on nutrition. Uh, that is just, I reckon that's you're just, interested that in is that. so not a promise because <laughs> that's just going to like tomorrow, that's just going to be what it is. Like it, you are what you are and it's great. So um, don't change coach Steve no. and I won't change either. <laughs> Except no, so for, the, for the better, except for the better. Except like, for the better. We're always, we're always learning. We're always, we're always, always learning. looking at self improvement, right, Nick? We're oh, a million things. percent, <laughs> and also like absolutely have fun too, everybody. But I'm just saying fundamentally, okay. No, good, good. Mm-hmm. Uh, Nick, I would like to speak <clears throat> a little bit about our good friend, the weightlifting belt. Okay. Uh, so uh, every now and then we have uh, questions come up about uh, lifting belts. Do I need one? Uh, should I get one? Um, you know, th- those types of questions uh, or, you know, how do I use one correctly? X, Y, and Z is something about weightlifting belts. And we do have a range of resources around using weightlifting belts. I've done a number of videos on, onto our Facebook social hub and such. But let's have a super quick rundown um, of, uh, you know, weightlifting belts. Do I need a weightlifting belt? Okay. So um, the first thing I want to address is that anybody can wear a lifting belt, okay? So, you know, I and nobody else should be a gatekeeper on, you know, using a piece of equipment such as a weightlifting belt. So regardless if you're a beginner or an advanced person, you don't need to meet a certain a certain benchmark before you think about using a belt. If you want to use one, great. If you don't want to use one, no dramas. It's simply a tool, a tool that we can use um, to help our lifting experience. Okay, so what can a weightlifting belt do? Firstly, it can, I use the word can it, with, with intent because it can, it might, it may be, okay. It can increase the sense of stability, meaning that, you know, you're wearing a, a brace around your midsection um, and you, as you lift, you may feel more stable, okay. That increased stability can lead to more power output. That power output ultimately leads means that you can lift um, a heavier load or feel more comfortable when you lift that load. Okay, you and I have both experienced it, Nick. Um, When you go to squat, let's say you know seventy five, eighty percent of your max, you you squat without a belt. It may feel like a a, it's relatively a high effort activity. You put a belt on, you know, great. You do this for days and you could bust out way more reps. Okay, so it can increase the sense of stability. Okay, next it can give you an external cue to brace okay so you've got this um you know piece of equipment you know material wrapped around your midsection and this external cue you could feel it against your your skin and your body and you can push and brace your midsection against that okay um and that can again lead to that sense of stability so the belt works because it's you know relatively tight around your midsection and because it's tight around your midsection you can push your abs against it. So you can brace against it. So you go and you like push your abs against that belt. That's how it works. Okay. So you can't just put the belt on 
and expect it just to do its magical thing. It's a tool. We need to use it, not just rely on it. Okay. In some cases, when you're wearing that belt, it allows you to push against something. Okay. And this is a, a, an interesting idea, a little bit more advanced. So I now use my belt more for exercises that you don't normally see people use a belt for. Okay. And that sounds really strange where, uh, Maybe a few months ago, I was using my belt a lot for the big three lists, practicing and training for a powerlifting competition. Now transitioning a little bit more into like hypertrophy work, trying to build uh, some more muscle mass, some more hardware so I can get stronger and re-enter the powerlifting arena. And at the moment, like I said last week, I have reduced one of my legs day and replaced it with an upper body day, okay? So now I'm using my belt uh, for two primary exercises. Okay. <laughs> it's going to sound funny. First one, overhead press. Okay. So when I do an overhead press, uh, you know, I do have a little bit of an arch and an overhead press, but wearing that belt, it gives me a little bit of something to kind of lean against as I go to press overhead. So that's a nice way for me to, um, feel more comfortable when I do an overhead press, cause I can kind of like lean against the belts. Okay. Strange one, a little bit more advanced idea, but it helps me to feel comfortable with an overhead press. Does that mean that you need to wear a belt with an overhead press? No, no, you don't have to. Um, it's something that I like to do, okay? The second exercise that I use a belt for, okay? It's another fun one, a bicep curl, ooh, okay? So when I'm doing a bicep curl, I find wearing a belt, I can really brace my abs, push my uh, like midsection against that belt. I feel really stable and I, when I do my um, bicep curl, I am less likely to swing my arm around, my shoulder doesn't move, it comes all from my elbow and I could do a fraction of the amount of reps I could do without a belt, which sounds, uh, you know, against what I'm trying to say, right? I can do l fewer reps, but those reps are of such high quality that I get a, an insane pump and insane stimulus on my bicep uh, because I'm not just trying to do as many reps as I possibly can, okay? So allowing using that belt can allow for those things, okay? So this is some things that it can do. Now, we need to, of course, talk about what the belt uh, is unlikely to do, okay? Not saying they can't, but it's unlikely to do. Firstly, it's unlikely to decrease the risk of injury. Okay. Now, some individuals would, uh, let's say, struggle with a deadlift. They're, they're trying to get a hundred kilo deadlift, stuck at ninety five kilos. They think, okay, I'm going to put a belt on, load up hundred kilos, I'm good to go, go for gold, um, and then you know they're thinking that that belt is going to save them. Okay. Um, which it might not. Okay. Uh, wearing a belt does not decrease the risk of injury. Injury occurs via uh, incorrect load management, meaning you're doing too much too quickly too soon. Um, so that doesn't mean that if you go too heavy, that's going to injure yourself. Uh, of course, that does have a maybe a higher chance of an injury occurring, especially if you never really delve in that area, depending on how you execute the technique and what structures are being loaded, okay? But wearing a belt does not uh, prevent an injury, okay? So uh, if you think that, okay, I'm just going to walk into the gym, put a belt on, and then wipe my hands and away I go, I'm, that's it, I'm safe. Uh, you know, there's more factors to that than just wearing a belt, okay? The next one is that a belt does not guarantee an increase in performance. So if you are struggling to, uh, you know, execute a deadlift at a certain weight and that's your goal, wearing a belt doesn't guarantee that performance. Um, and it might be that you're simply just not strong enough yet, okay? Uh, so don't expect to put on a belt and that's going to give you magical powers uh, to make you stronger, okay? Super summary, how do you wear one? Uh, there's lots of ways to wear one depending on the, the type of belt that you have. Um, there's some softer belts, some more bodybuilding belts, some more powerlifting belts. Um, I have a, a, what's called a lever belt, a little bit thicker, about 13 millimeter. I like to flick the thing. Um, and I wear it just in between my uh, hip bones and my rib bones, okay? So just that space in my midsection. Um, you don't wanna wear it too low where it pinches into your hip bones. Um, you don't want to wear it too high where it pinches into your rib bones. So do that nice spot in the middle. Some folk wear it above uh, their lower ribs, those floating ribs. So uh, more popular would be someone like Seb Oreb, Oreb um, the uh, Australian strength coach on Instagram, who wears it up a little bit higher. Again, no, no right or wrong. Um, and each coach may have their own biases about where to wear it. And ultimately comes down to comfort. Ultimately comes down to comfort and how you can push against it. Okay. So the super summary is that uh, do I need a weightlifting belt? Uh, it's up to you. You know, there's no right or wrong. You can wear one. You don't have to wear one. Um, if you've never worn one before, it may take a little bit of time to learn how to wear one. Um, if you have been wearing one for a really long time, you know, you might benefit from doing some exercises without it. <laughs> so let's say myself, you know, going back into some squats and deadlifts without a belt um, can be a great way to, uh, you know, 
scale down the exercise to really work on the execution of that exercise. Uh, so if you always wear one, try to not wear one. If you've never worn one, experiment with one, try it, uh, you know, and even think about other exercises that you could wear it with, um, you know, such as an overhead press or a bicep curl <laughs> uh, and, you know, see the effects of that. Mm. Yep. I, I love mine. I've, I've only started wearing it maybe in the last year. Mm -hmm. Before that, I was a raw AF. Yeah. But um, yeah, I've found that that I really enjoy wearing mine now, and I'm enjoying it at the moment because it's going down some holes. So I have an I have an old school leather one. Yep. That's just yep. basically, but yes, yeah, so some holes are going down. So that's the goal. So that's great. I'm nearly at the bottom hole of it. And have to punch a new hole in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I have to get my dad to do it. Roberto's got a leather puncher. Of course, Roberto does. Oh, of course yes. he does. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Nick, look, let's move on to our final segment here for today. Uh, we've got our question and answer. So first question here. <clears throat> I feel like I've lost two kilos as I've been sick. Ugh. Mm -hmm. Getting back on track, gym this morning, nutrition is actually struck. Nutrition, I'm actually struggling to hit my macros as my appetite isn't where it usually is. Plus, I'm getting heaps of indigestion from supplements. Any tips? Okay, Nick, take us away. What advice would you give this person? Okay, so with the supplements, I mean, I don't know exactly which ones, but definitely anything that's got any type of vitamin -y things in it, which most supplements do. If you have it on an empty stomach because you're not eating much, you are going to feel a bit icky. So, um, you know, generally anything with like a vitamin B or C um, can really feel a bit repeaty on you if, if you mistime it. So, um that's, I would just say that that's probably um, pretty much directly caused by um, not eating much. Um, and I don't blame people who, um, if you lose your appetite um, when you're sick, it sometimes takes a little bit of time to come back. There are some people that uh, go super hungry when they're sick and can't stop eating. And then there's others that lose their appetite. It's, it's similar to when you are stressed and you feel, um, you know, like you've lost your appetite. I'm one of those people. And I'm also one of those people who, when I get sick, my appetite goes down, whereas Shane will eat and eat and eat. So I would suggest don't stress too much about hitting those macros. Or and I'm sure that this person means calories overall as well. So I wouldn't stress too much. I'd just concentrate on um, just getting that nutritious food in and um, be a little bit intuitive with all of it until you start to feel a little bit better. I certainly wouldn't even worry about the supplements because remember they're the icing on the cake for when you for when everything else is functioning well. So this is going back to the base and um, you know trying to get that hydration, that um, sleep happening, and try and actually get whatever it is out of your system. Uh, I'd start with that those walks and then just. Um, you know, some, some nutritious food to start off with without worrying too much about tracking until you start to feel better. And then you, you'll know once you feel better and that appetite will come back once you can train a little bit more. Um, training is always a really good equalizer for that appetite. If you, if you think you've got no appetite, just go and do a leg session and then you'll realize that you do. <laughs> <laughs> it's serious. Yeah. Like sometimes I think, oh, my, I'm not hungry anymore. I'm, I'm fantastic. And then I go and do legs and I'm like, oh, I've got no idea what I've, what my body does. <laughs> <laughs> no, good advice. Uh, yeah. And, you know, just a, a oh gosh, a couple of months ago now, my experience with COVID where I completely lost my appetite, mainly because I rapidly and drastically decreased my physical activity levels where I, 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 I physically couldn't train. Um, I struggled to get my steps in. Um, I was very unwell and, uh, you know, my appetite followed that. So, you know, maybe, maybe for this individual where they were unwell, their physical activity came down, you know, talking about their overall step count, you know, if they're at home, they're not, uh, you know, cleaning the house, they're not doing their routines around the house, they're not out gardening, they're not doing those physical daily activity tasks. Um, and of course, your appetite will likely follow that. But as soon as you, you reintroduce physical activity, so get your steps up, get back into the gym, I'm sure your appetite will follow that very quickly. Correct. Nick, next question here comes from the forum. Um, it's from Katie and Katie writes, I eat dinner at 5 p.m. with a young family and find most nights at around 8 p.m. I have a huge craving for chocolate. Mm -hmm. I eat all the foods on my plan for the day. Any suggestions? Okay, uh, so 
taking this question off face value where we have a craving for chocolate. Now, often cravings um, are more to do with maybe a like a habit or a routine or like an environmental cue. So we can't move away from the, the fact that maybe Katie uh, at eight o'clock regularly before the challenge enjoyed some chocolate. Once the kids are asleep, oof, that's been a tough day. Kids are asleep. All right, I'm going to eat my chocolate. Okay. So that's the first thing that we need to identify. And maybe there is a cue where at eight o'clock kids are asleep. I'm going to turn on Netflix. I'm going to watch the latest episode of you know, whatever show you're watching. And because I'm watching TV, I like to nibble on something. And that's just a, a habit that you have you love chocolate and you reach for that chocolate. So that's the first thing we need to identify is that it could be simply a habit and a routine and it could be linked to an environmental cue or a time cue. Because if you're constantly saying at around eight o'clock, like it's on the dot, it's on the schedule, your body goes up eight o'clock, chocolate time, here we go, party time, right? Um, and this could be the same conversation um, with folk who, you know, love ice cream, who love chips, who love to nibble on things, Coach Steve and his hummus, like whatever it is, it could be the same conversation where, you know, you have a cue or a trigger in your in your life. And that could be a time based thing. It could be an activity based thing, like, you know, watching TV as an example, kids are asleep, you know, that's that sends off a trigger of events. Um, or, you know, it could be like an emotion sense, like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm bored. I, I that's that's my trigger for for something. Okay. The next thing is to ask yourself, you know, why is it chocolate? Okay. And of course, you know, we'll have our, our kryptonites. If something like chocolate is your kryptonite, um, you know, chocolate does have, you know, a little bit of an energy boost. So it could be simply because you are on a diet and, you know, you're low in energy and you want that little kick and that's okay. That can be totally acceptable, but, you know, reflecting on why is it chocolate? Chocolate does have a little bit of caffeine in there as well. Um, so you may find that, you know, you're getting tired. So you just want a little bit of a boost, right? Or you just had a big day. You just want a little bit of energy hit. And that's, that, that's fine. It's just often asking that question, why is it chocolate, not something else? Okay. You could always have a follow-on question of, could you replace that chocolate for something else that could be fit within the plan? For example, like the Maxine's nighttime protein. Uh, so, you know, you get your chocolate fix. It's a really sweet chocolatey taste and, you know, you could drink it, turn it into a pudding. You can mix it in, make it more of a custody taste um, or mix it in with another food item. Let's say like a yogurt, you know, the, the list goes on, make a, make, make a thick smoothie, you know, so you can kind of get this chocolatey fix um, that fits within your plan. So you're not going off plan. Okay. It's always worth asking yourself, are you actually hungry? Um, or, you know, is it is it purely a craving, is it an environmental thing? So, you know, if you are hungry, uh, you may find that by moving some foods around, maybe eating later in the day or choosing foods that are higher in volume. So maybe replacing some energy for some more fruits and vegetables, those types of things. Um, you may find that you don't have that same hunger craving, but we need to respect that hunger and cravings are slightly two different things, even though they're similar, it's slightly different, okay? Finally, you know, at eight o'clock, if you do have that really big urge for chocolate, um, a great way to curb that that craving is to replace it with another activity. So maybe you replace it with a, with a cup of tea, maybe at eight o'clock. Um, if your you know, partner's at home, the partner can look after the, the kids while they sleep. You go for a walk around the block, you know, eight o'clock kind of dark, but you know, you do something like that, go for a walk um, or start your night routine. So maybe you go have a shower, brush your teeth or go to bed. Um, you might find simply brushing your teeth, you know, the the... Uh, mint in the toothbrush or whatever flavor, not in the toothbrush, in the toothpaste or whatever flavor you have might be enough to kind of curb that craving because you go, well, my mouth tastes like mint now. I'm, I'm going to get ready for bed. Uh, I'm not going to go and ruin that by having some chocolate right now. Okay. So just some few strategies for you, Katie, um, and overcoming that craving for chocolate. Yep. Very good. Very good. Nick, the next question here comes from Inez from the forum as well. So Inez writes, I wanted to know if I've already plateaued with what I'm currently doing. Should I be doing anything differently? Should I be changing up my exercise program? I'm working on my sleep and getting more and better quality. Thank you in advance for your advice and support. Uh, so Nick, sounds like Inez is wondering if she's reached a plateau. Mm. Um, I think it was about a, a week or two and if she should change anything. So what advice should you give to Inez? Well, Inez, rem rewind the podcast about um, 30 minutes. And um, all of that stuff that we were just discussing before is exactly what you should be asking yourself. But um, the the thing is, what I must just say is um, if you're doing everything that is advised, the last thing I'd get you to do is change everything at this point. 
I would say stick with it, be patient. And um, what she also said was that she wants this more than ever. So when you want something, you're going to have to ride the wave of something. Sometimes something doesn't happen. You know, it's not going to happen maybe from week to week. It's the overall long-term goal that you have to have in mind. And also, like, what would you be doing if you weren't do, doing this? You know, um, how are you going to get closer to your goal unless you actually sit with it? So um, I think it's really important to um, stick with it. Uh, obviously, ask questions. But then if you're saying, should I be doing something different, go and review those questions that we asked you to ask yourself previously. Um, are you tracking your steps? But also the other thing is, and this is across the board and something that we all have to learn, just because we go to the gym and we train hard, just because we even you know do a certain amount of steps, then we also have to ask ourselves, how much are we moving during the day other than that? Are we just sitting down on the bed because we've worn ourselves out, which is quite fair and possible or you know like if you're at work do you just sit down or do you sometimes hop up and you know go and do some extra activity because that stuff all adds up as well because you can actually be pretty much sedentary if you um just go for a one hour walk and then a one hour gym session what are you doing for the other 22 hours of the day so it's just worth asking yourself that now that's not just directed at, at Inez because I know Inez is doing a good job. I've seen her, I've seen her deadlifting. I've seen her getting her, um, you know, her grip, right. She's doing everything that she can do. She's putting herself out there on the group. Good things are going to happen to Inez if she just keeps going without changing everything. If she suddenly goes and decides to do one of the latest um, jumping around workouts, that's where we're going to have problems. So you stay with it Inez, but yeah, this is just advice for everyone track your general activity as well like you know how i'm gesticulating i'm moving around and things that's what we need to do you know i mean you can't really help the way that you are if you're an expressive person or if you're not if you're naturally someone who's going to get up but just pay attention to that perhaps every hour make yourself get up walk around a little bit and it does add up doesn't it you know i agree uh mm -hmm. i do want to touch on that one part of the question which was uh should i change my exercise program and uh mm -hmm. i think we both agree uh no no you want to change no. your exercise program no um uh not to say that following a certain exercise program is a certain recipe or like a magical spell that you know you need to do it in this particular order in this exact way and if you don't do it this way you won't get any results but by just thinking that changing an exercise program is going to solve any um speed bumps that we have along our journey uh you know think again right you know it's probably better to follow an exercise program longer than a shorter period right so if you actually end up doing that same exercise program for let's say two meso cycles or two phases or over eight weeks rather than four weeks it's probably better than um you know trying to cut it short so if you are doing a training program for two weeks or or, or less and you think oh well uh, i should change my training program that is symptoms of what we call a um, lifetime intermediate. So someone who is intermediate and stays intermediate forever and they never actually progress into an advanced state of a person. So someone who program hops a lot is someone who uh, is kind of stuck in this perpetual cycle of not really seeing many results. So stay to the program, especially training programs, get better at the exercises that you're doing, get stronger, and that's where the results come. Yeah, give yourself a chance, get, get to you, you know, do that, see your grip as a challenge that's all you need to worry about get that grip going and keep doing everything else and you'll see the results it just takes time final question here comes from trisha on the forum and trisha writes i find it hard to train four days a week some weeks with work and family commitments what impact does it have on your progress if you train three days instead of four do you have any advice to add to get the most out of your three days of training thanks in advance Okay, so at the moment we have um, a, a, a sum total of the total amount of volume that we would like you to do. Volume meaning how many sets of each muscle group across all our exercises to complete in a week, okay? That is distributed over four days, okay? So that volume is directly related to the total stimulus that you have to build muscle, okay? So if you have those four days and you remove a day, you are removing a quarter of the total amount of stimulus that you have on your muscle, okay? So in terms of the first part of the question, what impact does it have on your progress? Well, it's less stimulus for muscle growth. That's straight up, okay? That's if you keep 
everything the same. So let's say we have a hundred units of total work that we're prescribing you, you know, total amount of sets, total amount of exercises, everything, a hundred units, okay? And you take away a quarter, you take away 25 units, you have 75 units. So you have less stimulus than everybody else, okay? Um, can you make that stimulus better or more? Well, each unit is very similar. You know, we're training close to failure at a load that is challenging and difficult. So that stimulus unit is, is similar across every person, okay? What we could do is across those three days, instead of doing, you know, well, let's say the, the four days you do 25 units of work on each of those four days. If you have three days, you could do, let's say 33 units of work on each of those three days. Sure, that means you're gonna be in the gym a little bit longer, maybe a little bit harder. And if you are already, you know, struggling to uh, train four days a week, if I'm saying train three days a week, but train longer each day, you might be like, oh, geez, Steve, I was, I was just able to fit in my workout, you know, in this time period. And now you want me to do more, you want me to do an extra, you know, 10% on each day. Like I don't have that time. Okay, sure. All right. Well, then we need to just um, be, um, you know, accept that we're going to have a lower stimulus. But if you could just increase your workload for those three sessions, you could get a similar stimulus on your muscles than if you trade on four sessions. Okay. So that's the first thing that we need to uh, address is that you can either just be, accept that you're going to have a lower stimulus than everybody else, or, um, you can increase the amount of work that you do on those three particular days, okay? Now, the total workload that we're prescribing you is a very rough average across a very broad data set, okay? So with us prescribing 100 units of work is for the average. Um, you may benefit from doing slightly less. You may benefit from doing slightly more. Uh, you know, myself, if you look to my training volume, you're like, gee, Steve, like you barely do any work. But I'm like, yeah, but that's what works for me. And for you, you might need a little bit more, a little bit different. So I can't say with confidence, Trisha, that you training three days a week is going to lead to less results. If anything, that might be the perfect allocation for you. We don't know that yet, okay? Now, if we look at the Australian um, uh, physical activity guidelines, Okay, so we're looking at guidelines here. Um, you know, we recommend that we do two days of strength training. So that's what the guidelines recommend, two days. If you're doing three days, you're above the guidelines already, awesome. So you're ticking boxes to see um, positive improvements in your health um, and in seeing positive improvements in your body composition. At this stage, we are not confident on what the actual bare minimum effective dose is. We don't know and we can't say that you need to do just 20 units of work and that's the minimum we don't know that yet um you know we can create rough estimates saying like well you know about like five sets per muscle group might be around a minimum you know 10 might be effective so you know anywhere around that range could be good for a minimum to maintain right we don't know that we can just estimate it right now um so my advice to you trisha is we can either a just accept that we're going to have a lesser stimulus than everyone else or b we look at increasing the total workload um, of each of those three days or c we can test the effects of those three days and continue to see progress right um and accept that those three days are better than two days and of course two days are better than one day right so we are still looking at ways that we can improve i would recommend that um you know we still work on um other key factors of the challenge which is you know increasing our physical activity, like our step count, you know, being adherent to our meal plan. So if you're struggling to find time to get into the gym around work and family, my next question would be, are you struggling to find time to do the other aspects of the challenge as well? Okay, so, uh, you know, training is just one portion. There are other portions that we need to identify. And then we might have to go, well, could you have that conversation with your work and family and go, well, these things are a big priority for me right now can I modify those family commitments so that I can have time for myself? So there's other areas that we can divulge in, Trisha. Mm, it brings up a lot, doesn't it? It does. It does. Mm. But look, Nick, let's wrap it up there for episode number 77. Woo! 77, uh, legs 11. What is it? Like, I, yeah. I'm, I'm working on my Coach Steve bingo. 77. I know, but 77 on the 8th of the 8th. Don't you think that there's something going on? Look. Nick, I think the Lionsgate portal is going to open up for me right now as I yep. step through and practice my roar as a lion. Yeah, but roar. Have you trained today or are you going to go train? I am about to train after this, Nick. So okay. hopefully manifest, manifest gonna, those lifts. Manifest the lifts right now and yep. the lion will provide me strength and courage to push through it. Yep. But Nick, <laughs> 77, done and dusted. We'll catch you next week for episode number 78. Thank you. 
Thanks for tuning in, guys. If you like the show, share it with a friend. Or leave us a review on iTunes to spread the good word. See you next time.